From the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and Sirius XM, this is the Work and Life podcast, which explores how to create harmony among the different parts of life, work, home, community, and the private self, your mind, body, and spirit. The conversation you're about to hear was originally recorded on the Work and Life radio show on Sirius XM 111, business radio powered by Wharton. Here is your host, founding director of Wharton's Work-Life Integration Project and author of the bestseller Total Leadership, Professor Stu Friedman. My guest for this episode is Anne-Marie Slaughter, president and CEO of New America, a think tank and civic enterprise dedicated to renewing America in the digital age. She's also a professor emerita of politics and international affairs at Princeton University and former director of policy planning in the U.S. State Department. We spoke a while back about her famous Atlantic article, Why Women Still Can't Have It All, which raised to a new level our national dialogue on the roles of men and women in our society. Anne-Marie refers to the Atlantic piece as simply the article in our conversation, which I hope you will now enjoy. Anne-Marie, thank you so much for joining us. Stu, it's my pleasure. It's always great to talk to you. You you had, and of course still have, a very successful and important career in foreign policy, but now you are you know, one of the really important faces in what I'm referring to as the work-life revolution. What was the pivot point for you? Certainly the publication of the article was just a complete turning point in my life. You know, the article went up on a Wednesday night online, and by Friday morning, I was on the front page of the New York Times, an article by Jody Cantor uh, talking about my article. 400,000 people had already gone on the website, and my mother called and said, what have you done? <laughs> she was happy or, or not so happy? Well, she was just kind of stunned, and I, mm-hmm. I think we all were. Uh, but really over the past two years, because it's been almost two years since I published right. the piece, and in those two years I've given uh, you know, probably almost 200 speeches, but I've also just spent a tremendous amount of time reading, reading your work as well as many others, and thinking, and that's been a much slower mm-hmm. process of change. Uh, let's stay with that. What what has changed since you you know, have, have been devoting so much of your time and attention to these questions? You know, a, a couple different things. I started out with the same question Sheryl Sandberg asked, which was why there are not enough women at the top. Uh, and over time, I became increasingly convinced that that was only one part of a two-part question, and it was very important to answer to ask the two parts together, which is why are there too, too few women at the top and too many women at the bottom? The answer to both those questions, why there are not enough women at the, at the top and too many at the bottom, is that as a society we don't value care and caregiving. That, you know, we say we do, we say we care about care, but actually people who take time out to give care pay a real career price for that. Mm-hmm. And so that's why we see this huge drop-off uh, in terms of women who are on the leadership track in their childbearing years. Uh, well, it's also for, people in the labor market. I have a theory that the closer you are to a diaper, the, the less you are valued in society. And that holds at both the you know early stages of life when you're in diapers and at the uh, end yeah. stages when you're in diapers yeah, again. No, that's, that's a very, very uh, pointed way to put it, but I, I, yeah, that's true. Because child care workers are the least paid people in, yeah. in our country. You know, if you take time out from other kind of work to give care, you will, your career will be penalized. You're, that's regarded as you know, negative time. Mm-hmm. If you are the sole caregiver and breadwinner. So you have no choice. You, you, you've got to support uh, and, and your family and provide and give care at the same time. You are much more likely to be at the bottom. We, we don't give you, you know, any real support for that. You end up taking jobs uh, that, you know, that you can sort of cobble together while, around your caregiving. It, it shook me up as a feminist because I realized that I had been raised as a, as a feminist proudly uh, to think that the work my father did was much more important than the work my mother did. Hmm. You know, that the way I was going to be somebody in the world was not to be what my mother did, which was to be a stay-at-home mom and then later a superb artist, uh, but, you know, defined primarily by as a, a mother, as a, as a wife, as a homemaker. 
Uh, and that, you know, that it was just obvious to me that, you know, you, you wanted to be a professional. That was more important than, than care work. And I really had to say, wait a minute, you know, that's just, that can't be true. If men and women are really equal, then the kinds of work we've traditionally done have to be equal too. You know, it, it can't just be that we're equal as long as we all act like men. Mm-hmm. And and so that was the first part of it. And that's really, mm-hmm. you know, most most women of my generation, whatever they say, they do not think that a, that a stay at home mom does work that is as important as being, you know, CEO of a think tank. Mm-hmm. They, they just don't. They I mean it's it's uncomfortable to admit, but that's not what we were raised with. Um, and the second point, and this goes to something you've talked about a lot, this is really important, this equivalence, this recognition of the, the equal value of different kinds of work is not just important for women, mm-hmm. it's vital for men. Absolutely. Because in the end, we are going to need you know, an equal number of people in the workplace and at home supporting different kinds of work. If you've got a woman CEO, she's going to need somebody at home who is, is what I call the lead parent or the flexible parent or the flexible caregiver, depending you know, whom you're caring for. And so the only way to do that is to value that work and to value it for men doing it as well as for women doing it. Yes. So what have you discovered uh, and what are you advocating for about how we value caregiving in our society? So the first thing is just to break this conversation open, because what I've discovered is there were a lot of young women thinking, you know, everybody says just make it work, do it all, have it all. I'm supposed to be able to be top of my career and be a caregiver, but actually this is really hard and nobody wants to admit it. Um, So that was sort of breaking it open. And I think similarly here, we really have to have the conversation that says, that, that exposes people's by the you know sort of they're not even unconscious there but they're biases people will not say openly some people will but few people will mm-hmm. say well no of course caregiving is not as important as you know being a professor or being a lawyer or being you know a factory worker or anything else they won't but that's what they think mm-hmm. so we have to bring that out we have to really say wait a minute you know let, let's look at this for a second taking care of children is investing in the human capital of the next generation. Mm -hmm. There's actually nothing more important that we do as a society, and if we do it badly, we pay for it economically, socially, criminally, uh, and and morally in the sense of wasted lives and wasted potential. And we're doing it worse than most of our competitor nations, as you and I both know and as many of our listeners know. Absolutely. And taking care of elders is an affirmation of our common humanity, of our recognition that you know, that's where we will all be, of basic commitment to human dignity, as well as, again, making people's lives longer and better. Right? I mean, there's a skilled caregiver can keep somebody you know, uh, connected, uh, active mentally, still productive in various ways. So you know, we, we really have to, to crack that open in terms of the fact that it, it takes skill and knowledge. It's a blend of neuroscience and psychology and uh, um, education uh, and and essentially experience. And we have to recognize that it's something we should be, you know, valuing every bit as much as we value lending money or, or uh, um, you know, drawing up a will. We've been talking about how traditional gender roles are becoming out of place in modern society. So have you noticed men taking on more caregiving roles so that women are able to pursue their careers? Absolutely. In fact, I quote you all the time. Uh, You told me that a student in one of your seminars said he wanted to be a stay-at-home dad. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I quote that all the time that, you know, look, (laughs) this is at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. It happened. That is a sign of change. And I know (laughs) also, uh, indeed, at New America, there are a large number of primary breadwinning women who are married, who have husbands, who have creative jobs or other other jobs or who are full-time uh, taking care of kids. Uh, so, I just, A, I just think you're seeing this happen. You're also mm-hmm. seeing this happen uh, in many middle-income communities where the jobs are just better for women and women are doing much better at school. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, you know, both Hannah Rosen's book, The End of Men, and Liza Mundy's book, The Richer Sex, uh, b- make this case uh, as in terms of just economically men are going to find themselves in a position where they're the most the best thing they can do for their families is to be the caregiver, not the breadwinner, right. or it's, at least the secondary. So what is it that, that we as a society need to be doing to make those choices uh, acceptable and indeed embraceable uh, <laughs> by, by both men and women? This. You know, I keep thinking we need the equivalent of the Bill Cosby show for stay-at-home dads. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have, there are various um, series that, you know, show dads at home, but we really need to do, I think, more cultural work around mm-hmm. celebrating men who've made this decision. And here's the place that where I think we're not quite getting it. You know, the, I remember... I think two years ago, on the side of New York buses, there was a TV show that showed three guys, you know, with their baby Bjorns. But it was kind of a jokey thing. It was a kind of, oh, yeah. you know, the, a, an the oddity. Um, I think we need to see those men as real heroes. What was it? Heroes. Yeah, heroes. Absolutely. Heroes and strong enough to to buck conventional ideas of, you know, what being masculine means. I mean, I see that as a really strong, secure man. And in fact, my 18-year-old or my 17-year-old son, when we were talking about, you know, whether did he care if his wife earned more money than he did or what he was doing, and he said, Mom, guys who worry about that are just insecure generally. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's, that's really a different vision. I always yeah. say, you know, my husband supports me. Of course he supports me. It doesn't make a difference who makes more money. The fact is, without him, I can't do what I do. What is support? Exactly. It can, exactly. It can you be know, financial. It, it can be It can be emotional. It can be social. It can be, it can be logistical. <laughs> yes. <laughs> making the domestic organization function. Yeah, exactly. You know, being there when you're on a trip, being the one who, you know, that, that your kids, you know, call – uh, and who is there or when the teacher calls or when the doctor calls or, you know, all those things that caregiving involves, a lot of it, particularly as kids get older, is not about actually, you know, watching them all the time. It's kind of being on call. It's being, it's the, being there it in without your consciousness being, too. you know, in their hair, but somebody's got to be there. Yeah, and, and, and being responsible in terms of thinking about and planning exactly. ahead. There's, there really has been a shift, particularly over the last couple of years, and it's becoming... Uh, less stigmatized and more normative, but still, we've got a long way to go, don't we? We do. We really do. I mean, if you think that it's taken 50 years uh, to 50, 60 years to get to um, the sort of real full shift, and we still have some ways to go even with women where you know, from initially bra-burning militant feminists, right, <laughs> to, you know, the sort of, well, she's a career woman for a long part of my life, even until I was 30, 35, that was still said with a little like, well, you know, that means you're not really doing what women are supposed to do, to now where you have, you know, more and more very strong women role models who can still be perfectly feminine, right? So you can have Padrasni Warrior, who's, you know, the head of Cisco and, and talk about her favorite shoes, you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. which is great. Um, we've got a ways to go before people see, you know, that a guy is absolutely every bit a guy and a, a, a strong, loving caregiver. What else have you seen that works in terms of really changing the norms, changing, you know, the social signals in terms of, you know, what men do and, and can be doing in the domestic front? So, you know, one of the things I've seen that seems most effective has been paternity leave in Germany and in a couple of Scandinavian countries, where what they've done is to basically make it use it or lose it. So they've basically said to all guys, okay, there's two or in some cases three months of paternity leave, and if you don't take it, your wife doesn't get it. So it's not... You know, you're you're just being stupid. You're leaving money on the table. And what that started to do, according to, I talked to a Norwegian, the former Norwegian foreign minister and a Swedish businessman, and they both said that the culture is changing such that companies are starting to look at guys who don't take paternity leave, sort of 
as as that's a sign of of really bad character. Like, what's the matter with you Mm -hmm. that you wouldn't spend two to three months taking care of your child when you're being paid to do that? So that social policy really is changing cultural values. Absolutely. And it really, and that's that's where it has to change. You know, it's it's the the example I like to use is is the, the social norms around smoking, which used to be seen as a sign of you know being macho or being cool, and now it's seen as really a sign of weakness, right? Mm-hmm. And we watched that change over the 1990s, yeah, where absolutely. it's sort of like, gee, you know, can't you quit? You know, it's bad for you. Why? Is, uh, it's more like. You know any other area where we're sort of ashamed of not being able to exercise uh, self-discipline, uh, and that's uh, that's the kind of cultural change that I think we need. This is your host Stu Friedman, and you're listening to my conversation with Anne Marie Slaughter on the Work and Life podcast. In the first part of this episode, we talked about Anne Marie's groundbreaking Atlantic article why women still can't have it all. Focusing on the problems that result from our society placing too little value on the work of caregivers, despite the enormous importance of their work for our future. In the second part, we discuss challenges women face while trying to raise children and advance into leadership positions. She describes the progressive policies some companies are implementing to create positive change. Finally, We talk about the attitudes of millennials regarding men's and women's roles, understanding how they think and feel about caregiving and breadwinning is essential for anyone interested in progress toward a more 50-50 world. Now, back to my conversation with Anne-Marie Slaughter. Well, let's let's shift to where you started speaking about earlier with respect to, you know, the too few women at the top. Your colleague, Liza Mundy, wrote in The New York Times the other day, uh, the media has a woman problem. I, I assume you yep. saw that. Yep, I did. So uh, the basic idea there uh, that, uh, you know, that it's 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 hard to advance uh, for women yep. in uh, the media as well as in many other fields Uh what what's your take on what she, on her her basic observations and argument and and what it means uh, for our society generally in terms of you know who dominates the media landscape? Well, I look in foreign policy; it's overwhelmingly true. I am constantly looking at foreign policy columnists, and as much as I admire and respect you know Tom Friedman and Nick Kristoff and Fareed Zakaria and David Ignatius, there's kind of a pattern here. Mm-hmm. You know? And in fact, Foreign Policy magazine got slammed uh, because they had, uh, you know, something out of fifteen women col- well, fifteen columnists. They had one woman, and you know, the women are out there. They really are. It's just it's it's a vicious circle. They're less well known, you know, right? Mm-hmm. So you know, there's this kind of well, wait a minute, we have to take a risk, um, and there's the risk seems greater because there are fewer examples of, you know, younger women who obviously become prominent and well-established older women, because men, too, you got to hire them when they're less well-known. Mm-hmm. But you, you've got all those images of the young, you know, the young Tom Friedman before people, when he was just writing on the Middle East, before he became the, the columnist he is. Mm-hmm. But there's no question that, you know, we're still, we're beyond tokenism, but not that far. Mm. And so what do you think it's going to take? Well, to really change the game. So, so again, part of it is it is getting women to the top. I mean, as a woman leader myself, and watching Hillary Clinton at the State Department, you need women who are not afraid then to put in a critical mass of women below them, right? And then it just starts to snowball, and then you start really getting to something that looks like parity. But, you know, for most men, if they walked into a room that is half women, they're going to perceive that as majority women. <laughs> they're, they're going to really, because they're so used to the norm seeming like mostly 70, 30, 80, 20, uh, 85, 15. Because that, that at the upper reaches, that's really what we're still talking about. So it's still a very big change. And to many men, that's going to feel like the women are taking over. 
So you think we're going to get there to something like parody in, in the media as well as in other I, important fields? I do. But again, I this comes back to the caregiving issue because if you just, if you had a straight line shot where every, you have 50-50 going into the workforce, or as Liza will tell you, you know, 55, 60% women and uh, 45, 40% uh, men, then, and it's just a straight shot, then really the, the size of the pool, the law of averages, you will get there. What's happening, of course, is that this huge drop-off, even where women stay in the workforce, they're no longer on the leadership track. Mm-hmm. And so that comes back to, okay, well, in the first place, a certain number of women have got to be able to stay on that track all the way up because they've got somebody else at home who is doing most of the caregiving. Or you have to let women and men tread water for a while and then still be considered for leadership. So it can't be this up or out idea that that we have. Or you have to let men and women take time out or go work at less demanding jobs and get back in. Mm -hmm. So like Goldman Sachs now has what they call returnships, Mm -hmm. which I I love the idea, right? I mean, if we can have internships, you can have returnships. And, but they're, of course, you know, they're, they're, they're getting people back up to speed and then putting them back in. So you know, you could leave a law firm at 42 as a young partner, uh, do other kind of work, in-house work, uh, project-based work while you're being a parent or taking care of your parents or however mm-hmm. it is. There is no reason you can't come back in at 55 and still make partner. Absolutely not. You're still going to, if you're a woman, you're likely to be able to, to be in good health until you're 75, 80. Um, you got plenty of time to be a partner. You know, our kids uh, are going to live to be 100. Exactly. And so what does that mean in terms of the ebbs and flows of life and career, and why does it have to be a straight shot for, Absolutely. for men I or for women? I tell people to think about their careers in, as interval training. You know, athletes at peak performance know that you metaphor. go all out for a while, and then you ease off for a while, and then you go all out again. And, you know, you can think about it in 10-year chunks, 15-year chunks, 8-year chunks, whatever your intervals are. But most it's, most organizational you know career structures are not – conducive to that kind of model, at least that's, today. No, that's right. That That is absolutely right. Although I think the ones that aren't are just going to be losing talent mm-hmm. and not recruiting great talent. And, you know, I was talking to um, was at, at Generation in London, which is a, an investment firm that, that Al Gore and, and uh, uh, David Blood, who used to uh, be at Goldman Run, and they were talking about um, firms they've invested in who systematically look for women in their 50s who have been, you know, who left great jobs uh, and and couldn't get back in. And it's a huge talent pool, you know, where you can recruit all these wonderful women. So I do, I think that's true now, but I really do think market forces are going to start correcting at least some of that. I'd like to shift gears now and talk about millennials. They are, after all, the future of our country, so they're obviously going to have a big impact on the issues we've been talking about. Anne-Marie, you've been traveling across the country, speaking at many different colleges. What are you picking up from younger people? What do they value? So I guess the first thing that comes to mind when you ask me that question is they are they live in a world that is on the one hand, economically bounded because they're coming, you know, they're, it's a hard mm-hmm. time getting jobs. They have a lot of student debt. Mm-hmm. They're very conscious of that. And yet, on the other hand, technologically unbounded, mm. right? So, they, they, you know, there's this world of extraordinary possibility given that they have literally all of human knowledge at their fingertips. But not just knowledge, you know, they can put up something on YouTube, they can organize a movement, they can, you know, connect to people in all sorts of communities. So it's a funny blend of economic realism, of kind of a hard-headed, like, don't feed me a line about how everything's going to be fine, (laughs) because Mm -hmm. I know that I've got a lot of debt and it's hard to get a job. And on the other hand, looking at my generation or our generation and saying, boy, you, you know, there's much you guys are don't really get the world that we live in you don't get the what a world that is 
as deeply connected and and digital as ours is can do. What's the gap there? Well, it's so deep. I mean, I always say it's as great as the gap between the the establishment madmen of the 50s and the hippies of the 60s. Mm-hmm. But we don't see it because people don't dress as differently. <laughs> they don't march around. I, They're I starting to. Have you been to Brooklyn lately? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But but I really think it is, I think it's, I think my generation starts with an image of individual agents, you know, like, like economic man, right? The rational calculator who pursues his career and it then connects to others, but his starting point is to be separate. Whereas I think digital natives start from connection, You know, their entire lives are lived with other people, online and offline. And transparently. Online, you know, brings everybody together. Mm -hmm. And that gives them a sense of being part of something bigger and a sense of possibility that I think my generation doesn't have in the same way. That's so well put and so so important to identify. So... So what does it imply then for for the you know the relationship between the generations and and what you know what the next ten years are going to bring in terms of uh, you know real social change? Well, I <laughs> I think it means we need to be listening really hard because uh, you know if you think about the analogy, but of the fifties versus the sixties, you know the sixties revolution happened, then there was a backlash, but. It really was the the sort of values of kind of much greater individualism, much greater uh, freedom in lifestyles of all kinds. That's what shaped our world, right? Here we are with women and you know gays and lesbians and uh, African Americans and and every other kind of minority with an African American president and gay marriage you know that that in the end it was the cultural revolution of the 60s that has shaped our world and i think similarly it's the um it's not just the technology it's the shift in mindset mm-hmm. that the technology creates that is going to shape uh, our society much more so i think basically we should be listening hard and engaging younger people in multi-generational teams now is that something that you're doing at new america foundation yes and new america is very young i mean by the median age i think is probably under 40 uh, and we have lots of technologists and we have you know people who are doing right graphic novels and gaming and uh you know thinking really hard about educational technology and uh privacy and digital literacy and uh how to build assets through uh you know mobile money they're, they're really people thinking about how you use technology to uh, address important public problems, but also it, that it it's not as simple as it, there's an app for that, right? It's really the blending of technology with what, I mean, you're an organizational psychologist. You know better than anybody. If you don't change the behavior, the tech, it, it, nothing will happen, right? You know, it's like having a database or an app that just sits on your phone. So what's, uh, what's, First on your mind when you think about like the coolest, most exciting project that New America is uh, is working on that that our listeners would want to know about. Oh goodness! Um, I know <laughs> there are many. What is the one? Um, well, I think the most exciting. Well, there are many, but one of the most exciting is looking at the future of higher education. So just exactly in line with what you were talking about of, you know, our kids are going to live to 100, they're going to need to be educated many times in their lives uh, for many different purposes. So that the idea that education is something that happens between kindergarten and uh, high school, college, graduate school, that's going to disappear. Mm-hmm. We are looking at what I I say, you know, the project we're doing and the, what our group is doing is education will be lifelong from multiple sources with measurable outcomes. I, I'm and, teaching a course right now in Coursera that has 44,000 students in it around the world. And yeah. the, the ages are from, you know, from 13 to 80. Yeah, that's extraordinary. 
And think about that. Think about it at age 70, thinking, you know, I would really like to learn to code. Mm-hmm. Like, why can't you? Right? You, you know, actually, the, the, or I would, you know, now is the time that I've always wanted to learn a foreign language uh, and, you know, go and see what I could do with that. You, you really will be able to get different kinds of education, so, and you'll be able to convert your experience to educational certificates. It's it's such an exciting prospect, and I, I know that our listeners and I am really eager to learn more about that and, and so many of the other projects that New America is working on. We, we're going to have to wrap up here. Anne-Marie Slaughter, thank you so much for being here and sharing your 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 journey, your experience, and, and the exciting things that you're working on uh, at the New America Foundation. Stu, it's always a pleasure, and uh, you know you do fabulous, fabulous work. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Anne-Marie Slaughter, who shared so many powerful and important insights about caregiving, gender roles, and millennials. We're moving toward a society where women and men share caregiving responsibility equally, a society where stay-at-home parents are valued equally to career professionals. Women will be able to spend more time on career ambitions, and employers will enable women and men to stay on the executive track even if they leave the job market for a few years to care for their children. Those are some of the big ideas here. I hope you found the information in this episode to be helpful to you as you pursue harmony between work and the rest of life. Thanks for listening to this episode of Work and Life. This conversation was originally recorded on my weekly radio show on Sirius XM 111, Business Radio, powered by Wharton. Tune in for live broadcasts of Work and Life on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. For more about today's guest and about previous guests, check out our blog at workandlifepodcast.com. Join the conversation by commenting there or tweeting at Stu Friedman. And for more ideas and tools for creating harmony among the different parts of life, check out our website, TotalLeadership.org, and my book, Total Leadership, Be a Better Leader, Have a Richer Life. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share it with your friends, family, and coworkers. Until next time, I'm your host, Stu Friedman, and I thank you for joining me 